A good Friday morning to you and welcome to Real Talk that was and still is Ayla Brooke and the Soundmen that from their album Desolation Sounds on Fallen Tree Records. Ryan Jesperson here with you alongside Sarah Hoyles and Samuel Brooks. It is July 9th. I already feel I was, I was uh, lucky. To, I, I look at this. I'm, we're 15 seconds into the show and I'm already bragging. I was going to brag about what I had a chance to do yesterday, but it's not really bragging, actually, because it has nothing to do with anything that I own. I was just privy to a swimming pool, to an outdoor swimming pool yesterday, which is a big deal for people that do not have an outdoor swimming pool, uh, which includes folks like us. Little doggy pool does not count? Little doggy pool. Well, hey, you can make it count. Okay. Absolutely. It's all about perspective. (laughs) I bet you there's been, speaking of like, by doggy pool, you, uh, there's AKA, been a run AKA on doggy pool. The pools. kiddie pool, yeah, sorry. The, like the plastic, no, it, it doesn't <laughs> apologize. It depends on your frame of reference, right? It's there's either kids in the doggy pool, dogs in the kiddie pool, or everybody in the backyard soaking their feet, just soaking to stay their feet in the cool. pool. I bet you you could probably go on Kijiji right now and sell those little plastic pools for like 300 bucks. I think everything's, there's a run on everything right now. Yeah. Everything's triple the price right now. Point is, we were lucky enough to be in this pool, uh, just really enjoying the hospitality and the friendship of, of some family in the great outdoors. My Uncle Clark says to me, and he's bang on already on July 9th, he says, I kind of feel like we've already squeezed a lot out of summer, you know, no matter where you are right now. Now, that's not to take away from people that have actually been like, yeah, enough summer. Thanks very much. It's been 44 degrees and we can barely breathe. Um, but what a what a couple of weeks it's been absolutely beautiful uh, we've got a great show in store why don't we kick it off the way we do every morning which is reminding you that our presenting sponsors at Bitcoin well have joined us on this journey I filled out like a questionnaire for them they're working out they're, they're working on a blog for their website right now and so one of their communications team members reached out and said hey would you write a few sentences on why Real Talk wanted to work with Bitcoin Well? I said, you know, that's a great idea. We don't talk about that a lot. At the beginning of every show, I sit here and talk about, you know, why you should go to them for advice or this, that, and the other. But why did we want to do business with them as a company? And one of the big reasons, first of all, of course, they're headquartered in Western Canada. They're out of Edmonton, just like us, ATMs, Bitcoin ATMs across the country. But also... They're lassoing something. This is my shout out to everybody down in Calgary. You know, everybody getting set for the very divisive Calgary Stampede. I was you know, going to say, is it, is it divisive? You're going to say lasso? Oh, are we going to get into lasso, lasso? It is lasso. Uh, yeah, well, depends on who you talk to. It's like coyote or ca- coyote, coyote or, or coyote. Like if you, if you actually talk to a real, somebody that really has to deal with them, with them farming. Bitcoin Wells, like, are you seriously talking about shooting coyotes in the middle of our ad? Yeah, that's one of the, another reason why we do business with them, because they don't care. They love this stuff, I think. 
the people that actually have to deal with them call them like it's like a it's called like a cute it's like a cute talk to somebody from saskatchewan and ask them what they call it that sounds vaguely australian yeah kind of like that. cute they don't they yeah. don't say they don't they don't they definitely don't say coyote and so it's either coyote which is maybe like if you if you live within 15 minutes of an urban center yeah. or maybe it's cute after that i love it but i can't fake it don't try to divert my attention. It is still lasso. No, lasso. Oh, Shoot. so you're already all Shoot. twisted up. If you want to get your perspective untwisted on things like crypto, check out the team at Bitcoin Well under the Sponsors tab at RyanJesperson.com. Real Talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. We sort of have an idea of what we might lead off with this morning, but I mean, all bets are off. Things are because I would imagine, you know, one of the the great benefits we have with this show is is an engaged live audience. I mean, these are like hardcore audience members that show up and hang out with us each and every morning. And uh, and I'm sure that there are some very strong opinions here on pronunciation out of the gates. We, We could check in in just a second. In just a second, we'll see. It's tough to talk about pronunciation typing it out in a live chat though so i wonder where this may go penny joining in says oh hey i got my real talk ball cap yesterday penny very well done if you check out ryanjesperson.com right now i'll just show you right across the top of the page you can click on merch and then check this out we've got our real talk t-shirts We've got our Real Talk ceramic diner mugs, and we've got our Real Talk new era snapback caps. You can find those all under the merch link at ryanjesperson.com. It's going to be a great show. Coming up in a few minutes, we're going to talk to Dr. Sinan Aral. He he's, uh, works at this post-secondary institution that some people may have heard of uh, called the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, otherwise known as MIT. He's director of the MIT Initiative on the Digital Economy. Really looking forward to this. He's uh, the, got a TED Talk on how to protect truth in the age of misinformation. And then, of course, a new book, The Hype Machine, uh, how social media disrupts elections, the economy, and our health, and how we must adapt. Looking forward to that conversation and then a great roundtable coming up in about eh, 25 minutes' time or so. Uh, Tom Conway from Small Business BC, Nancy Wilson from the Canadian Women's Chamber of Commerce, and Adam Legg from the Alberta Business Council. Bit of an all-star roster to discuss post-COVID economic recovery in Canada. I'm looking forward to that conversation. I already had one of our audience members kind of, uh, I threw the brakes on there. I was going to say troll me on Twitter, but troll has obviously extremely negative connotations. Yeah, that y- yes. Right? Affirmative. I mean, unless you're out on, on Slave Lake or, or somewhere this weekend, and you're lucky enough to be out there and you're just trolling, trolling. Looking, looking to bring in a trophy. Uh, but yeah, if, if, if you're not angling, and if you're on social media, trolling would be a verb that would come with sort of like hyper loaded connotation. So I, I would actually like to retract the word. Uh, but if but an audience member engaged me. Oh, there's a better way. of putting Isn't that? It, it sounds lovely. very it sounds very positive. Yes. I was engaged by an audience member this morning when I tweeted that we were going to be talking about co- post COVID-19 economic recovery and an LB uh, LB said to me, who, by the way, uh, already is sort of i'm going to say on the positive side of the ledger you can see here has the profile photo of gumby which i've got all the time in the world for back in the day um who's what's gumby's horse's buddy's name pokey 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 well done you two um did you know that from is pokey in toy story or or you know that from the original anyway not important it's just Uh, in the zeitgeist yeah (laughs) pokey is in the zeitgeist zeitgeist is one of my favorite words of all time Ooh. Yeah, yeah, we had that. Uh, we, we've got we've got that on record. So so LB says to me, "Yikes!" Responding to my tweet and promoting our conversation about economic recovery, says, "Yikes!" Has anybody said we're post COVID? Not even Jason Kenny goes that far. He just says, "Open for summer. Some of you are going to die." And I I kind of went, "Oh, uh, well." First of all, first of all. The show's official position is not that we are at a post-COVID point, but the show's official position is that sometime, at some point, we will be post-COVID. I mean, it'll it'll never, 
the experts say, virologists are, are saying that it'll never actually totally go away. And those of you that have chosen to not get vaccinated will always kind of sort of have it in the back of your mind. I hope that it's a possibility. We've seen some people getting sick. A couple of people, uh, pr- quite prominently, the stories have been reported, tragic stories of people that have been double vaxxed that have contracted COVID and passed away. I mean, it still can happen, albeit rare. But when we talk about post-COVID, in my response to LB, I said, hey, at some point we will be. Always a good idea to look at the roadmap before you embark on the journey. And so this is not implying that we are post-COVID, but that at some point we will be. Also, nobody looks at roadmaps anymore. Well, I disagree. You look at roadmaps? Sarah, go first. <laughs> what? Well, I was just going to say, I mean, are you talking about the paper ones? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, yes, but I would say that they've now, you know, gone over to the Googs over to the Google Maps and I use yeah. that. So please don't t- say the Googs ever again, okay? The Googs, the Can't Googs. Can't stand that shit. Can't the stand Googs. it. When people are like, uh, what is it? What are what some of the, like, obs? Like when obs. someone says obviously, yeah. obs. I'm like, please, please no. At least not on his, on, his, on an esteemed intellectual show. You like prefer zeitgeist. Time. I prefer zeitgeist. Okay. I prefer words that I'd have to double check before I spelled them. Okay. Um, so we'll be talking about that, not, po- not post-COVID-19, but of course people are getting there. People are optimistic. People are starting to look and, and, and I think are, are cautiously optimistic, cautiously optimistic about things like patios, restaurants, businesses, some workplaces reopening. We heard from an audience member by way of an email. I've not yet read it on the air yet, but, but saying that by the Labor Day weekend, their company's already told employees that it will be by the Labor Day weekend. So they got a couple of months notice mandatory to get back into the workplace. Did you see that? Which I thought was pretty interesting. Sun Life has announced that they are letting their staff decide whether they want to come in or not across yeah. across the entire organization. I think there's going to be a ton of organizations that do that. Yeah. And, and maybe they'll break it up into departments, mm. right? And maybe like if you're in whatever, you got to come in. But if you if you work in this department, you know, you can work from home or those types of things. I bet you more people will. I mean, so many folks have had an opportunity folks so many folks have had an opportunity to reimagine what a work-life balance can look like and and even if it's something as small which is not that small but eliminating the daily commute and paying for parking all of a sudden you've got an extra hour 15 on your hands and you're saving 350 bucks a month i bet you a lot of people would choose to stay home we'll also obviously spend some time i i think today processing uh, this will be a little bit more regional, but but if you're paying attention to politics across the country, you, you probably know that Alberta's premier yesterday shuffled his cabinet, uh, creating some new positions. Uh, you know, this is the red tape reducing lower spending government, right? It's the most expensive premier staff and the most expensive cabinet in Alberta's history under Jason Kenney. What's very notable, I think, uh, and probably most notable about this is the demotion of MLA Leela Ahir. Uh, Leela Ahir is, you probably remember, one of those, one of the few that stepped forward after this whole liquor cabinet incident. You remember the, the photo, that long lens kind of surveillance photo of the premier and the parks minister and the health minister and uh, who a few other people were there. I can't remember off the top of my head. And uh, and basically, people were saying like this was this was an explosive photo, right? It was the the, the white tablecloths and the Jameson whiskey. And I don't think I need to explain it to everybody. I'm pretty sure you remember Leela Ahir, at uh, that time minister here, came forward and said it wasn't appropriate. And you know, essentially, the premier owes Albertans an apology, and she paid for that yesterday, being kicked out of cabinet. And replaced by MLA Ron Orr, uh, who's Alberta's new Minister of Culture. Sarah Hoyles, would you like to chime in on this? Cat got cat got your tongue. Mm. Minister of Culture uh, and status status of women of women. Yeah. Status of women. Yeah. So looking at just you know this just broad stroke around how many women there are, I would in Alberta, I would say you know half the population. And we can't find one woman to fill that role? Yeah. Not one? The optics aren't great. Well, and also just, you know, then when the rubber meets the road, when he has to make decisions, he's not coming to the table with experience in that. And it's, I'm sorry. I, and I know 
you know they'll explain it all the way, right? They'll say they'll say ah, but there's gonna be, there's an associate minister and there's gonna be strong women on the staff and you know yada yada yada. I, I just to me, if I can say, um, it's a non-starter. You just can't have. <laughs> You just can't have a, a ministry that includes the word status of women and have a dude steering it. You just can't. But then again, these aren't, you know, your average people. This isn't your average party leader, right? This, is, this isn't like the, the average party. This isn't the average government. Um, not necessarily open to criticism. Uh, not necessarily open to influence outside the inner circle. And Jason Kenney, probably quite frankly, doesn't give a flying fuck what anybody thinks about his choices for cabinet, right? It's about political protection. I thought that this was kind of an interesting take on it. You know, Stephen Carter, uh, he's a political strategist. Uh, he's he's one, of the, uh, one of the monsters on that three-headed monster that is the Strategist podcast. We got to get them back on the show. That was a really great Ooh, Friday roundtable when they joined us. And Stephen was uh, tweeting yesterday about this, and, and he said, you know, when, when the media was talking about this cabinet shuffle that was coming, Keep in mind, Carter knows a thing or two about deflecting public criticism. He was chief of staff for former Premier Allison Redford. So he's not just some other, you know, uh, armchair political strategist. The guy's been there. The guy does this. And so he says, you know, as media reports cabinet shuffle coming, he says, so here's what I'm thinking. That's a good idea. Right. It allows Kenny to walk away from really bad decisions like fights with doctors, fights with nurses, bad curriculum, mining in parks. Jason Kenney says, you know, brings in the guy who says that the premier is a gift from God to run culture, says Stephen Carter. We're fucked. So that's his official opinion on the cabinet shuffle yesterday. It was an opportunity. I, when, you, when you take a look at cabinet shuffles and I'm, I'm in these group chats, and we've got these private conversations and everybody's like, we know what we're talking about with politics. Here's what I'm hearing. Here's what I'm hearing. Everybody was like, I'm hearing Shandro moved out of health into municipal affairs, right? People are hearing, I, I, I'm hearing that, you know, uh, you know who, who's going to move into education, right? Maybe, 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 you know, you can switch up that ministry. Or maybe you move Nixon out, you move somebody else into parks, and then all of a sudden, you know, when the NDP starts hammering away at you on things like plans to mine the eastern slopes, they say, listen, we've made significant changes in that ministry. And under this new leadership, under new minister, whatever, we're going to do this. Not the case, right? Parks, health, education, all of the more contentious, you know, for that matter, municipal affairs. I mean, these are these are ministries now that remain in place. A minor cabinet shuffle makes government more expensive. Will it work to deflect? I mean, this is... I think a lot of strategists now are taking a look at this yesterday. I saw some political scientists, most notably out of Calgary, saying this is Kenny trying to control infighting in the party. This is Kenny trying to trying to sort of quell an uprising that may be happening in caucus or even in cabinet. Maybe that's what it is. You can let us know what you think to talk at RyanJesperson.com. Always want to hear your thoughts. We want to remind you this weekend, you take a look outside in your neck of the woods. If you're where we are, we've got some incredible days in store when it comes to the sun, when it comes to the heat. There's no better place to be than the Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park. That's Palisades, Nemeo, Newcastle, Westmount, Y Gardens, and Baseline Road. Whether it's a dilly bar, whether it's a soft serve cone with that trademark Dairy Queen curl at the top, whether it is a blizzard, whether it is, I mean, there's cold options. But sometimes you need a burger. If you drop our name, Real Talk, if you tell them Jespo sent you two cheeseburgers for five bucks, two doubles for seven at the Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton in Sherwood Park. Also a big shout out to the teams at Campers Village. If you check out our website here, I was just sending you there right on the home page here. At the top, you'll see that link for sponsors. I want you to click on that. If it's time to upgrade your sleeping bag, your tent, your hiking boots, your camp stove, your headlamp, whatever it is, if you're like me, you can always find a reason and to upgrade cool stuff that takes you into the backcountry. Under the Sponsors tab, click on Campers Village. It's going to direct you right to the Summer Sale landing page. It's up to 40% off the top outdoor gear, the Summer Sale at Campers Village. Of course, you can catch them in-store as well as online, and uh, they'll ship anywhere across Canada. Most orders ship for free if they're over 49 bucks. Big shout-out to our friends at Campers Village. Let's get into this. Looking forward to, I mean, it's not every day we get an MIT data scientist on the show. This guy's got a TED Talk that's made waves. How to protect truth in the age of misinformation. That's an assignment I think we all have in front of us right now. He's just released, after four years of working on it, a brand new book, The Hype Machine. 
It's a pleasure to welcome to Real Talk, Dr. Sinan Aral. Thanks for making time for us today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. So this is this is, I mean, four years working on a book, uh, but but many, many years studying the subject matter. When we start talking about misinformation, when we start talking about, you know, some of the challenges around a data driven digital era, when were some of the red flags first on your radar? Well, the first time that we thought about misinformation was during the Boston Marathon bombing. Uh, and we were right there because it happened very close to uh, our campus at MIT. I don't know if you know this, but a police officer, Sean Collier, was shot and killed during that uh, set of events during the Boston Marathon bombing. And we were monitoring Twitter and we saw a lot of misinformation spreading about where is the bomber and where, where is the danger and where are the police going and how many bombers were there and so on. And at the time, uh, we were uh, studying the flow of information online. Uh, our PhD student, Sarush Basugi, decided to focus entirely on studying misinformation for his PhD thesis. And that led to a 10-year study uh, of the spread of misinformation online with Twitter that we published on the cover of Science Magazine in 2018 after studying all of the true and false news that had ever been tweeted over the 10 years of Twitter's history to that point. That's really what kicked it off for us. So there's, I mean, do we need to differentiate? I mean, I guess sort of bigger picture, we can talk about the power of social media to inform or misinform, to lead or mislead. Uh, do we need to, to differentiate or has your work uh, drawn a line between those that would inadvertently or unintentionally spread fake news versus the opposite, the people that know exactly what they're doing that are following a playbook? Yeah, there's actually a big difference. And in fact, there are two different terms in the in the sort of science of it all, misinformation and disinformation. Mm. Disinformation is the intentional misrepresentation of the truth for some sort of objective. So uh, we've studied different types of geopolitical disinformation campaigns that are designed to achieve some sort of objective. And then there's misinformation, which is just sort of falsity spreading uh, errantly without any real nefarious objective. And these two things look different in the patterns of the data. Uh, they have different consequences, uh, but they have a lot of similarities as well. It's hard to tell one from the other sometimes. And uh, a, a lot of the reason why disinformation spreads is that uh, we don't pay enough attention to either. So how when, when it comes to, to, to social media and our everyday lives, how, how do we need to set the table for this conversation? Because I know I know that there are some people that are like on Facebook. They drop in from time to time. They're on LinkedIn every once in a while. There are people that are hyper engaged on Twitter that are in the trenches every day fighting for their ideology or their political party or the issues that matter to them. You got people that scroll on Instagram. I mean, there's so many different when you talk about social media, it's almost like talking about media in general. I mean, it's like, what are we talking about here, right? I mean, I think that's the point. So if you think about it, uh, about 14 years ago or so, social media didn't exist. Now over 3 billion people across the world are on social media nearly every day. Uh, in addition, you know, uh, I was, for instance, speaking to a 17-year-old yesterday, and I asked her, I said, do you think it's possible to meaningfully participate in the social circle of your age group without being on social media? And she said, without hesitation, absolutely not, definitely not, which means the younger generations are uh, sort of in it, uh, you know, without question. Yeah. And let me give you one other statistic. So if you think about relationships formed uh, you know, romantic relationships, which then go on to uh, create the future generations of our species. Uh, romantic relationships born of algorithm suggestions surpassed relationships born of traditional meeting, uh, you know, socialization in 2013. 
So what effect is this having on uh, the future of humanity through, you know, are the, are the matches created by algorithms different than the traditional matches? And what does that mean for our gene pool and the, and the sort of future evolution of our species? I think we are just scratching the surface of the impact of this technology on our society. I like to say that social media is rewiring the central nervous system of humanity, and I believe that. Can there be positives to that? I mean, do you sense some positives? Absolutely. So social media, as I describe in the book, we're sort of at a crossroads right now between the promise and the peril. So when Nepal had its greatest earthquake in the last hundred years, Europe and the U.S. donated something like $10 million uh, for relief efforts, and Facebook spun up a Donate Now button and uh and raised 15 million from 770,000 individual donations. The Ice Bucket Challenge raised a quarter of a billion dollars with a B for ALS research in eight weeks. The founders of the Black Lives Matter movement say there would be no Black Lives Matter movement without social media. Mm -hmm. There are definite positive pro-social mobilization that's possible with social media. I think also we've estimated in research at MIT that it creates uh, something like uh, uh, 350 million dollars a year in consumer surplus uh, in the in the U.S. alone, and that's from life-saving health information, the ability to find jobs, reskilling, meaningful human connection, and so on. There's a lot of positives, but we've also seen disruptions of our democracies, our economies, and our public health through anti-vaccine content and so on. Uh, and so we're right now at the crossroads between the promise and the peril, how we regulate it, how we use it, how we design the business models are all going to uh, determine whether we achieve the promise or whether we're stuck with the peril. I bet. I mean, we, we could probably I mean, aside from your busy schedule, we could probably keep you here for three hours and you and I could probably say, OK, you mentioned three right at the top of the hype machine, right at the top of your book, right? how social media disrupts elections, our economy and our health and how we must adapt i mean we, we could probably go for an hour on elections we could probably do at least an hour in the economy and health what an interesting bit of subject matter i don't want to take things for granted i don't want to breeze past them i almost feel like elections we almost know what you're talking about but but i really want to pick on the economy right now i want to dig into that one are you talking about stuff like the you know the reddit i mean that whole story around GameStop stuff like that or is it bigger picture than that than these one incidents it's both. So in the book, I actually described how social media could really start to create uh, a lot of um, uncertainty and disruptions in our equity markets. And I talked about the 2013 uh, hack crash when Syrian hackers hacked the AP News Twitter handle and put out a tweet that said Barack Obama had been injured or killed in an explosion in the White House. And it wiped out uh, $140 billion in equity value in a matter of minutes from one tweet that went viral. Then uh, we've seen what happens uh, with GameStop and AMC and other types of companies in the meme stock era of the last several months. But also it's about small and medium sized businesses depending entirely on Facebook and other types of social media for their marketing, as well as large enterprises. How do we think about the business implications of social media? So it has far reaching consequences on the economy. LinkedIn, another very important social media platform is a massive source of labor mobility uh, job seeking, job reskilling, and professional social networking, uh, it has vast implications for the economy. Yeah, I, I'll be honest. I don't spend a ton of time on LinkedIn. I, I guess I'm on there because I've had a couple of, through the course of interviews over many years, we've talked to some corporate recruiters and headhunters that have said, you know, you should take LinkedIn more seriously. You should show it more respect. But I typically, I view LinkedIn as a little, obviously, as you've said, a bit more of a professional community. There's the odd person on there. I think that's nailing themselves to the cross, so to speak, when it comes to professional reputations with some of their content. But for the most part, people seem to hold it together on LinkedIn, maybe more than Facebook, if you know what I'm saying. I mean, do you look at certain platforms as more problematic than others? Well, it's funny. Uh, we had a day long social media summit at MIT and we had some of the world's uh, foremost thinkers on the topic spend a day with us uh, last April. And my friend Eli Pariser, who wrote The Filter Bubble, was there, and he made a really interesting comment. He said that 
the way you behave in a certain space is about the norms of that space. You don't behave the same way at a bar that you do at a library. Yeah, good point. And I think we see that. We see the same thing on social media. There are different types of norms around different types of social media and the behavior changes across them. What happens, uh, doctor, to our to our brains? I mean, you're a data scientist. So I mean, you've got all kinds of cool ways of analyzing this stuff. What happens to us when we log in or when we check for notifications? Well, it's funny you say that because we've got a chapter in the book called Your Brain on Social Media, which goes through all of the neuroscience evidence of what happens inside our brains as we use social media. And there are a couple of things there that I think are important. The most important, I think, is this dopamine reward cycle. So uh, Sean Parker told Mike Allen in 2017, he said, yeah, we designed Facebook to give you little hits of dopamine when you got comments and likes on your content in order to keep you coming back for more. And the neuroscience evidence uh, bears this out. So when we use social media, it gives us dopamine hits, which excites us and enrages us and, and wa- keeps us wanting more and coming back for more so that we can get that social validation, those likes, those comments, and so on. And that's a big part of the design. In addition, our brains evolved to process the social signals that we get from other human beings. Then we invented a technology that scaled those social signals into the hundreds of millions of real-time messages every single day. And when you look at it in that way, the meteoric rise of social media is no surprise because it's like tossing a lit match into a pool of gasoline. Our brains evolved to process what social media gives us, and then it scaled those signals to the hundreds of millions. So how does a guy like you, I mean, this is a personal question, but how do you manage social media? Are you all, do you have all the apps on your phone? Or are you logging in all the time? And are you available to people? Very carefully is how I manage it. Uh, after doing all this research, I take it very seriously. I am on most of the social networks, Twitter, Instagram, and so on. Uh, on Instagram, I've got a professional account, which is much more professionally oriented. I've got a personal account, which is private, and I have family moments there, which are, are for my family and friends. Um, but uh, on LinkedIn, I'm much more professional. Uh, on Twitter, it's really kind of partly personal, partly professional. So I've got, I, I sort of uh, adhere to some of of these similar uh, concepts of different spaces, different behaviors. And I try to really uh, be conscious of my use of social media and its use of me at the same time. Use of you. I love that you said that. I mean, people people point out it seems obvious, but I don't think it is. Uh, people are ringing the bell that have said if if if, if you are t- if you're using anything that's free, you are the product. And uh, and I think that that's important to, to keep reiterating. You know, we've talked a lot about curriculum. We've talked a lot. It's always fascinating when we start looking into what kids are learning these days in school, people looking back on their own educational experience. And there seems to be two recurring themes. Number one, people want junior high and high school students to talk more about real life fiscal management, things like loans and credit cards and all that kind of stuff. Number two, how to identify fake news or how to determine valid or legitimate sources. How are we doing as a society on that front right now? Anecdotally, I look at it, it seems like we're doing a pretty lousy job. Well, you started by mentioning this idea that if if it's a free product, then you're the product because they're selling advertising. And that leads me to note that in the book, I describe these four levers that we have to pay attention to, which are the money code norms and laws. The money, as you point out, is the business models. The code is the design of the algorithms and the platforms. The norms are how we as a society build the norms of how we adopt and use this. And the laws obviously are regulation. And I advocate strongly in the book for more digital media literacy for uh, our children, for our kids as they're coming up. They do need to be able to identify fact from fiction in a uh, digital environment that doesn't really lend itself well to being able to do that easily. They do need to uh, think through digital literacy and media literacy about the psychological effects of uh, the technologies that they're using on their self-esteem, on their concept of socialization, uh, on the meaning of face-to-face interaction, on what trust means and how it can be established either face-to-face or online. Uh, So I think all of this is really important to prepare future generations. We see some strides in the right directions. We need a lot more.
Okay, we're going to be, uh, we, we have a municipal, our home province of Alberta, we've got these municipal elections, right? There's going to be some new mayors, and city councilors seeking re-election. That's coming up. Uh, we're expecting a federal election this fall. I mean, we, we expect that writ to drop probably in the next number of weeks. A lot of people think it might be in September. Then all bets are off, right? I mean, federal elections especially, you know, social media is going to be a huge player, as if I need to tell that to an American. So what should people be keeping a keen eye on? What should, what, what's the canary in the coal mine when it comes to the things that concern you about the politicking involved or the electoral implications of social media? Well, in the in the book, I have a chapter on the spread of misinformation called the end of reality. And part of that chapter is about the effect on politics and elections. And you're right, we could talk not just for one hour, but for many hours about that topic alone. We've seen the book opens with the story of Crimea, which uh, is a fascinating story of the use of social media to frame the reality on the ground in Crimea during an annexation uh, to ensure that other international actors wouldn't intervene. That story opens the book. It's a fascinating example of what can happen. Fast forward to yesterday or the day before where we have an assassination of a president in Haiti. And now lots of information is coming out about who was involved, who were the assailants, you know, were there US citizens, were they DEA or not DEA? As soon as the assassination happened, I tweeted, I said, listen, prediction, there's going to be a lot of misinformation flowing here. And by the way, during the Swedish national elections, uh, the Oxford University estimated that a full third of all of the tweets on Twitter about the election were false. A third. And so I think I think we have to be very careful, especially in these moments where a decision has to be made by an electorate and there's not a lot of time to verify information. You see that happening in Haiti now. Uh, any election, whether it's in Canada or elsewhere, I would recommend uh, paying close attention to whether to verification of the sources of information. Dr. Aral, let me ask you this in closing. Uh, how do you when you encounter what you suspect or even know to be misinformation, disinformation on social media? I see it all the time. Some people engage, some people withdraw some people are just not going to get in what do they say what, what do they say it's not worth wrestling with pigs they enjoy it and you just end up getting dirty however however that phrase goes i mean what do you do what's your approach to misinformation online i think that what we've seen in research is a couple of things one we have to avoid the knee-jerk reaction of spreading it sometimes what i see when misinformation spreads is the uh preamble that says I don't know if this is true, but if it is, it's really interesting. And if you're saying that when you're quote tweeting something, it's probably not true and you shouldn't be tweeting it, or at least you should verify it with just a couple of quick Google searches that can debunk most of the misinformation out there. We've also seen in research that nudges towards accuracy, getting people to think about the accuracy of information is really important. So uh, not knee-jerk retweeting, but also uh, pointing out, hey, uh, I've seen this floating around. This has not been verified. Uh, remember that there's a lot of unverified information floating around. So maybe we should think about that before we consume or share this uh, is sort of how I approach it. Look at this very small example happening in real time. I wanted to cite the source and get the quote correctly. I learned long ago never to wrestle with a pig. You get dirty and besides the pig likes it. However, the World Wide Web is telling me that both George Bernard Shaw and Mark Twain can be attributed to that quote. So there you have it. There you have it. Here's an example right now. Unverified information. Maybe I'll just back right out of that one, doctor. Congratulations on the new book. It's a fascinating read. Obviously, people can find it everywhere. They get good books. The Hype Machine by our guest out of MIT, Dr. Sanan Aral. Really appreciate your perspective on this. Such an important subject. Have a great weekend. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. You bet. Yeah, you can find more about our guests. Of course, uh, Sarah Hoyles every morning pushes out from our Real Talk RJ Twitter account. You'll find it on Twitter at Real Talk RJ. The guest lineup, you can follow Dr. Aral there on Twitter. A fascinating follow. He's got a lot going on on his Twitter account, and we encourage you to check it out. I wanted to refer your attention online. If you're looking for a way to, to better yourself, maybe, maybe a way to upgrade your skill set, maybe you're optimistic about... This post-COVID-19 economy that everybody's talking about, which includes 
in some industries, a, a pretty robust job market. I mean, a lot of people right now, I talked to an employer yesterday. He said, if we could find the labor, we could double our workforce right now. That's just one company. Power Ed's all about that. These micro courses, on-demand learning, in-demand subject matter, on-demand at powered.ca. Whether it's learning more about artificial intelligence and machine learning, whether it's a, a workplace looking to broaden its understanding of allyship and inclusion. What about digital wellness 101? That fits perfectly to what we were just talking to Dr. Rawl about. You can find it all online at powered.ca. Ca. We also wanted to remind you that the team at McBain Camera has got their world famous trade in event going on right now until the end of July. Your chance to receive a 25% bonus value. This is a great opportunity for those photographers that are either looking to upgrade their gear, but maybe you don't want to maybe you don't want to blow the bank on it. You've got some lenses, some old camera bodies you're not using. They still work great. McBain's been working with photographers to upgrade their bags, to bolster their rosters when it comes to what they're carrying around to those photo shoots for decades. They've earned the trust of their customers, and that's why they get such a huge response every July for this trade-in event. It wraps up at the end of July, so you're not going to want to wait on that. Best thing to do, bring your gear in, whether it's old school stuff or maybe six months old, have them take a look at it. They may need a couple days to appraise it. They'll let you know what you can trade it in for. And then there you go. You can learn more at McBainCamera.com. When we talk about economic recovery across Canada, what does that look like? I mean, we can look at big, high-level numbers. Employment numbers are obviously big. Consumer confidence is what the experts will talk about as well. But does it depend on industry? Does it depend on region? Does it depend on other demographic factors? Probably that's why we wanted to reach out to three experts, three business leaders, three industry. Uh, can we call them influencers? I sure think we can. These are three people who have their fingers on the pulse of Canada's economy. Tom Conway is the chief executive officer for Small Business BC. Started with a, a food service company in Chicago since then. Served as the president, CEO of Easter Seal Central California, executive director, British Columbia Schizophrenia Society. Nancy Wilson's the founder and CEO of the Canadian Women's Chamber of Commerce. It's a national not-for-profit advocating for the economic priorities of women-owned businesses. Nancy herself is a chartered professional accountant. And Adam Legg is the president of the Business Council of Alberta. He spent more than 20 years building, leading high-performance teams in business, public policy, economic development. You probably recognize him as the 18th president and CEO of the Calgary Chamber of Commerce, also former director at the Haskane School of Business, VP and chief economist at Calgary Economic Development. To the three of you, thanks so much for being here. Appreciate your availability today. Nancy, why don't we begin with you? When we start talking about post-COVID economic recovery, I had an audience member right out of the gates today when I used that terminology say, we're not at post-COVID yet. Hold your horses. How are you approaching uh, developing a game plan or bolstering your understanding of what the economic landscape looks like over these next number of months or years? Yeah, I mean, certainly um, the term post-COVID is a bit of a misnomer. I mean, um, COVID um, is not something that's been eradicated uh and i think that um you know i'll leave sort of <laughs> the epidemiology of uh of the virus to experts but um when we're talking economically uh, or in terms of you know the economy certainly i think post covid really um is it refers to the sense of getting back to business and that means a lot of different things for a lot of different people um and certainly certain industries uh have uh, are going to get back to business uh, much more quickly than others i think that um as vaccination rates increase where that's sort of the the barometer of what post COVID means to a lot of people when um, are, are these sort of social distancing restrictions being lifted and people are allowed to interact with one another, um, go to a uh, shop and um, are kind of out and about um, the way we sort of used to be. I don't think 
quite honestly, I don't think that things will ever go back to normal or, or go back to the way that they were um, in in the same way because people have experienced something completely different than anything we've ever experienced before, and that's going to impact um, how we live and, and work going forward. Uh, Tom, you're in an interesting, I mean, uh, you know, as, as, as the CEO of small business BC, I, I, I guess it's a completely different ball of wax. I mean, we should differentiate here. Are we, we're talking about big major corporations. We're talking about small businesses. I, I know that through the course of the pandemic, um, I, even some personal friends of mine, they're small business owners. They've done really well through COVID and they don't want to talk about it. They feel kind of bad. Actually, they're experiencing some guilt, but their business has exploded for other people. Business has imploded through factors totally outside of their control. I mean, a lot of entrepreneurs have completely lost their businesses. It, 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 it's scorched earth right now when you start talking about what their landscape looks like. So, so as the CEO of Small Business BC, how do you approach a discussion like this? Thank you, Ryan. Um, yeah, I think that you're absolutely right. There, throughout the pandemic, I did notice there were people, uh, businesses who were pivoting, you know, to to stay afloat. So we had businesses that were uh, distilleries that were converting to making hand sanitizer, right? And there was a lot of fabric companies that were converting to making masks to try and continue to be a part of the economy. But there were so many small businesses that were negatively impacted by the pandemic um, in BC. There are over 500,000 small businesses, and we employ 90, or um, that makes up 97% of all businesses in BC are small businesses. And about 58% of our employees uh, work at small businesses. So, and then you're, you're talking about the ripple effects through uh, the community too that, you know, when you close a business, it just touches so many other parts of our economy. And so, what we've been doing at Small Business BC is working with both the prov provincial and federal governments to provide those resources during this time so that there, there are those folks who are ready to start a business. And after the last year, we've seen so many um, entrepreneurs who are like, you know what, this is my time. I'm going to start my business now because I don't wanna, I don't wanna you, after, see, after seeing what we've lived through, um, this gives them an opportunity to really make that positive change in their lives that they've always wanted to do. As mentioned, Adam Legs, president of the Business Council of Alberta. Adam, it's it's been kind of a uh, as if I need to tell you this a bit a bit of a double whammy uh, for Alberta based businesses, most especially those in oil and gas, traditional energy. So w when we start talking about what a recovery landscape looks like right now on the prairies, or in particular in Alberta, it's kind of a twofold conversation, isn't it? Yeah, right. I, I think what, uh, you know, so much of what happened in COVID was, was unexpected, but, you know, the, the, the double whammy of the commodity price uh, drop that happened just as, as COVID was hitting, uh, we've seen a return on those prices and quite frankly, most of the commodity prices that Alberta relies upon, whether it's oil, natural gas, uh, wood and fiber, uh, canola, agricultural grain products, et cetera, they're, they're, they're almost at record highs. Some of them actually are at record highs. Um, and so much of uh, Alberta's economic lift right now, you know, most of the members that I talk to feeling very optimistic, very positive about where we are right now, largely as a result of, uh, of, of strong prices, but also in the way in which they've retooled their businesses. They've just been able to, to figure things out. They've become leaner, uh, more focused, um, and, are, and are sort of better set up for the future, embedding more technologies, figuring out how to do things in, in automated fashions. Um, using their talents better. So, you know, the reality is I'm seeing a lot of optimism, uh, at least amongst our member base, for sure. Yeah, and I want to follow up with you, Adam, because I'm really glad you pointed that out, and I'm glad you said that. I mean, I, I think that, you know, the average entrepreneur, and entrepreneurs are wired a little bit differently, aren't they? And some of them, they'll stare challenges down in the face and find ways to adapt and do everything that they possibly can to not just save their business, but to grow their business in spite of challenges. So, I mean, over the past, I mean, if, if, if you're hunting for silver linings, you may not have to look too far for some people to say, here's what we've learned personally, professionally, from a corporate standpoint, what have you, uh, it's been an opportunity, I guess, in some way. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the, the phrase never waste a good crisis comes to mind in this scenario. And, and people really, they did. They, they, we, we, we've heard stories of the technological advances that have happened. We accelerated two years worth of innovation and technology in six months. And I think in many cases, that's very true. Um, I think you're also seeing uh, companies trying to figure out 
uh, what they're doing now more domestically from a manufacturing and procurement standpoint. They're, they're dealing with different trade relationships. Uh, so they're trying to figure that out. So there is so much that they, they built in there. Um, and Alberta just has that, as you know, Ryan, that just sort of DNA of, of can do entrepreneurial spirit, figure out how we can get these things done um, and, and find a solution. So I've been amazed to see what's happened, the resilience in, in, in Alberta companies over the pandemic has been quite remarkable. Nancy, I'm intrigued. When you say that, you, you know, you don't necessarily seeing things, you, you don't see them ever really going back to normal. I, I found I've experienced as a public commentator that using the word normal, you got to be really careful because people will say either what is normal or there is no normal. But but what do you see? I mean, either specifically changing or what do you think will be those prompting factors? What, what leads you to feel the way you do? Right. Well, I mean, uh, as uh, as was just mentioned, I mean, businesses that have survived um, or even thrived during um, the last year and a half have, um, you know, there's been a real focus on this pivot um, with implementing technology, becoming leaner, really um, scaling back to the the minimal amount of employees and and automation this uh this is great from a uh, business standpoint for business owners and and uh, moving forward and innovating what it does mean is that um a lot of people who have lost who lost their jobs at the beginning of the crisis um those jobs may not be there to uh to come back to um, and so I think that entrepreneurship is going to increase both, um, from the standpoint of people deciding not to return to work because of uncertainty, as well as having the experience of working from home and saying, you know, I don't want to spend two hours of my day in a car and, and eight hours, um, in an office. I want to choose the way I live my life as well as people being forced by necessity into entrepreneurship or self-employment because that's the way they have to um, put a roof over their head because they can't, th those jobs aren't there. So normal means whatever normal is for, for you in your life. And, but I think that things, things have changed and, and there's no way to go back. Uh, Tom, obviously, s something that Nancy's saying is resonating with you. I can tell by your body language. What is it? I, I think, actually, I prefer if we don't fully go back to the way we were. There are many things that I think probably, and I, and I, I see Nancy's agreeing, uh, you know, I think there are a lot of positive that came out of this unfortunate uh, last year in the pandemic. And uh, yes, a lot of negative, don't get me wrong. But you know, I think about things like the, like the work at home opportunities that have been presenting themselves. You know, many businesses didn't think that um, it could ever work and we've proven that it can work. And so um, while it's a positive impact, I think it's been a positive impact on the environment because less people were on the road traveling. It's a positive impact for families because people were able to spend more time with their families um, and get, you know, ha have a better work-life balance. Yes, it, it, people not taking transit and things like that, it's an, also then have a negative impact on the economy. So uh, I think we have to take an overall look at um, wh what we want to go back to. And this is this pandemic has given us that opportunity to look at look at life differently and how we can make a positive change out of this Make lem lemonade out of lemons. Yeah, sure. Well, Tom, you you and your husband had a, a food service company in Chicago. You're familiar with the industry. Uh, when it when it comes to industries, I mean, big picture that I think have experienced significant disruption and may look dramatically different moving forward. When I say food services, maybe we need to clarify whether we're talking about restaurants or whether we're talking about hotels or hospitality. But but are you expecting? A, Will it will it be almost sort of the BCAD interpretation of food services when we evaluate how the pandemic impacted food services? Yeah, I, I think having a husband who's a chef, I'm I'm kind of uh, knowledgeable about you know the s sterile conditions and all the things that restaurants and other food and beverage services, hotels, and others that are involved 
um, are able to keep up their their businesses. They were always, you know, of, of all of all businesses, restaurants were always uh, keeping their places clean and things. So they just had to make new implementations to stay afloat. And I think things were maybe differently here in BC than they were from Alberta, than they were from Quebec and Ontario um, in the way we, we have done things. I think definitely tourism, hospitality, food and beverage. Um, you know, when I think of industries that were really hit hard um, compared to everybody, and I don't mean to diminish anybody else's experience by saying that, but I, I think still we're seeing the, the negative effects on tourism, which ripple down to hospitality and everything. When I look at downtown Vancouver, you know, we're located in the city of Vancouver, um, without the cruise ships coming in and things like that, um, there's a lot less people coming into those businesses. And there's still, you know, while it's on a, a resurgence, there are still some businesses that probably won't be coming back, unfortunately. Yeah. Adam, uh, people can check out your, your website, adamleg.com, to see more about your book, Making Remarkable, how to deliver purpose, inspire people, and build a platform for exceptional results. From an employer's standpoint, or let's say leaders in the workplace, what has changed when it comes to the onus on leaders, do you think, as a result of this past 18 months or so? Well, I think a couple of things. One is everybody's been looking for answers. Everybody wants some sense of comfort, some sense of stability. And so uh, a combination of really trying to get the best handle on the situation, but also that, that sensitivity, that humility of trying to reassure people, trying to give people a sense of, of comfort and security uh, throughout this, this pandemic, but also being quite transparent about what they do and don't know. Uh, I think it's, it's important that particularly as all this unfolded, uh, leaders being very open and candid about what they could share, what they didn't know, what they were going to be trying to do uh, was really important. Um, with the with the move to Zoom and platforms like this, uh, ensuring a sense of connection was still really important. So you saw the really strong leaders were reaching out to their people on a regular basis, uh, ensuring they were doing okay, ensuring they had what they needed. Um, so much of this was very isolating for people. There's a lot of uh, mental health issues that arose. And so leaders were also ensuring that their staff had uh, availability of uh, mental health resources and other supports that they needed. Um, but then there was also that focus on, on sort of the core purpose of the organization. Why are we here and why do we get up every day? Um, and so many companies and so many organizations rallied around that in this pandemic to really say, you know, the example was given earlier, distilleries pivoting to, uh, to manufacturing hand sanitizer, that we're all in this together uh, in terms of contributing where we can. Um, and companies rallying their employees around that bigger picture, the way in which we can support uh, our fellow Canadians was really uh, an important part of leadership as well. Uh, Nancy, we know, I mean, statistically, the evidence is there that the, the pandemic has had a disproportionate impact on women in the workforce on, uh, from an economic standpoint. Um, I mean, you're the CEO of the Canadian Women's Chamber of Commerce. What's, what's the position on that? And, and how do you begin to address that? Or how are businesses across the country beginning that? Yeah, uh, I mean, it has been an extraordinarily difficult year for for our women, uh, sorry, our members rather, um, who are um, business owners and entrepreneurs, um, as well as, you know, uh, women identified Canadians um, who in in the traditional workforce um, who have lost their jobs um, and um, you know have have left the labor force on mass um, and you know the challenges and any you know systemic inequalities that existed prior to the pandemic um, still exist um, are were exacerbated by the pandemic. And so when it comes to this, this period of so-called recovery and, and rebuilding, you know, we, women, um, business owners are starting from a much more, uh, marginalized and, and distressed position. So, uh, you know, we were certainly hoping for more support and more financial um, um, intervention uh, from from the budget. We didn't see uh, as much of that. Um, so, you know, our organization is, is working with 
the government. We're always uh, working on advocacy and, and we're really just trying to highlight the challenges that our, um, our members as business owners are facing. And as I said before, you know, a lot of the, uh, a lot of women who were in the workforce prior to the pandemic will be seeking, um, uh, you know, self-employment now simply by necessity because partly for because of uncertainty they they won't re-enter the work uh, the traditional workforce because they simply don't know if their their children will be back in in school um, on a consistent basis going forward or they may choose self-employment because that is the best thing for for their family situation and it's not just kids out of school it's elder care it's it, it's other things that have have really come to light uh, i want to ask all three of you that question i mean and and obviously you can answer it or, or approach it uh, in your own ways but but adam when it comes to you know obviously the role that and we could we could talk about women we could talk about other uh, marginalized populations or or let me just say potential employees uh or or you know members of the workforce that are swimming upstream right that are facing that are encountering more hurdles uh than other people may i, I mean obviously these are important potential contributors to the workforce and in many circumstances people that are integral to economic recovery so so what is intuitive or what is an astute approach to that what is an answer to some of these challenges look like yeah right i i mean, complicated uh set of, of solutions here but ultimately you know i think the the one that uh, is really vital uh, and we've we've advocated for it is a, a more robust uh, child care system uh at least in, in alberta i know the federal government is rolling it out bc had a big announcement yesterday following sort of the quebec model uh, of low-cost uh, daycare so we we do think that early childhood development and education and daycare is a, is a critical part of that to enable more women uh, particularly to come back into the workforce um, we, we have a, a variety of, of populations that just have always had higher unemployment rates, and that could be uh, everything from seniors, people with disabilities, um, immigrants. And so it's, a, it's just ensuring, I think, um, A, that we break down some of the barriers. We've got a long systemic set of issues associated with Indigenous peoples uh, and, and dealing with some of the trauma they've experienced and getting the education system to, to support them uh, in better ways. Um, in, in terms of seniors, we, do, we need to sort of break some stigmas as well, I think, amongst employers uh, who are willing to take some chances on, on uh, some underrepresented populations. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it's really just a, it, it's this, this pandemic has, has highlighted the exposures that so many people face, uh, the vulnerabilities they have in precarious work. Um, and I think we just need to kind of come together and as, a, as, a, as businesses, employers, and say, you know, we need to do our part to make sure that we're not contributing to this problem. Um, I know uh, many of, of our members uh, are very proactive on, on diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives, um, are really investing a lot in, say, training and education in Indigenous communities in which they're doing work in. Um, and so it's, it's not an overnight uh, solution. It is going to take time, but I think the pandemic has really shone the spotlight in the corners of, of Canada's sort of labor force and, and, and uh, skills and training situation that we need to make sure that we're, we're doing a better job on a go-for basis. Adam, I know, I know that a lot of people are going to be excited to hear the president of the Alberta Business Council endorse the idea of, of affordable or, or subsidized or, or, or however you want to call it, uh, you know, government-supported child care, however you want to phrase that. Because I think oftentimes, I mean, I see it firsthand, the conversation around that turns into a left versus a right thing or, or, or entrepreneurs versus socialists. I mean, we get this really divisive language. We just talked to a social media expert from MIT who I'm sure could dig into this with us. But you, you'd get the sense if you only paid attention to the comments section that you wouldn't have business leaders and entrepreneurs endorsing or supporting subsidized or supported child care. I, I feel like it might be an obvious question, but what's the business argument for it? If you could spell it out. Yeah, there's there's definitely some strong evidence, and, and it, even that is disputed at times, depending upon the perspective. But there is there is evidence out there that suggests the economic impact and the return on investment of uh, child care and daycare and early childhood development is is in you know sort of a one to a two to one uh, payoff ratio, or even a, you know, some depending on the study, it, it's at least 
better than a one-to-one -one relationship. <clears throat> so not only do you get that uh, ability to have more people in the workforce, you're getting an economic contribution because of that. There's more people working, there's more tax uh, base uh, as a result. Um, and it opens up the, the, the talent pool, quite frankly, for employers. And so uh, the last thing they want to be uh, experiencing is shortages or, or limited talent pool in which they can draw from. Um, and we know the, 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 the female demographic is largely bears the child rearing and child care uh, roles um, is 50% of our population. Why would we do anything that would restrict our cap capabilities of, uh, of tapping into that really strong and experienced talent base. So, um, and, and, and we're seeing incredible uh, movements with uh, an organization, one of our members in Alberta here called The 51, which is a, mm. a female entrepreneurial uh, venture capital firm investing in uh, female entrepreneurs, doing an incredible job launching uh, those kinds of companies. And so there's really, it's all about the ROI, it's about the tax base, about the talent pool, it's about the innovation that happens uh, when we unleash female entrepreneurs. So, you know, there's, there, it, it's, it's, it's not necessarily a, you invest today and you get a return tomorrow. It is a, it is a, a longer run payoff, but um, it's clear there are many, many more upsides than there are uh, downsides okay. in our group. I, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the 51. That's that, uh, just a really remarkable group. We've had an opportunity to check in with them on the show, and I absolutely love the focus, and it's such an important one. I, I want to ask the three of you, and, and Tom, we'll start with you in just a second, on how you'd evaluate uh, government support for businesses and, and what, what you think – uh, the role governments should play. We can go from municipal governments providing supports all the way through to provincial and federal governments. That in just a second. To our listening audience at home right now, I want to uh, draw your attention to parkpower.ca. You know, we tell you every single show that they power our hashtag Real Talk RJ. Well, if you're looking for electricity, internet, or natural gas, the official Real Talk thumbs up, the stamp of approval goes to Park Power in part. Because on their website, you can compare utility rates right now and find the rate that's right for you. Whether it's electricity, natural gas, or internet, you just go on the website and then they give you a couple of real quick and easy questions. Where do you need the natural gas, for example? Your residence, your business, your farm? If you can't decide, an opportunity to bundle your utilities. And a reminder, 10% of their electricity profits go to nonprofits you choose from their roster on their website where you want that donation to go. How cool is that? Parkpower.ca with the promo code 2021 dash real talk saves you $70 off your first bill at parkpower.ca. If it's moving season for you and your family, first of all, congratulations. But second of all, can we all agree moving sucks? I mean, not the excitement around the new place or not the sentiment around the old place, but the actual move. It sucks, right? It's stressful. Alta Moving and Storage has been in the business taking the suck out of moving. Now, we've come up with that slogan, not them. But they endeavor to make it a positive, not a sweaty, miserable experience. They've got these pod-style moving containers. They drop them off in front of your place at your convenience you load them they move them you unload them at your convenience if you need to store those pod style containers for a while that's their business too you make sure you let them know that real talk sent you alta moving and storage at altastorage.ca and also a shout out to the teams at Sherwood and St. Albert Dodge. Tis the season to be getting out into the great outdoors, whether it's a Jeep Grand Cherokee for your family to get to your favorite provincial park, or maybe it's a Ram 3500 to pull that big toy hauler with all the kids' four-wheelers in the back. St. Albert and Sherwood Dodge has the inventory to get you what you need. Selection's tough right now. No matter what province you're in, no matter what vehicle you're looking for, that's why the teams at the Sherwood and St. Albert Dodge locations share inventory, making it way easier for you to get your hands on what you're looking for, new or used. You can access their websites under the Sponsors tab at ryanjesperson.com. Nancy Wilson is the Executive Director of the Canadian Women's Chamber of Commerce. Adam Legg is the President of the Alberta Business Council. And Tom Conway is the CEO of Small Business BC. We're talking about the economic landscape 
post-COVID, though I feel like right now I shouldn't even be saying that anymore. Tom, a big part of this, businesses either doing their best to stay above water or trying to support their employees in ways that they can. A big part of that has been government supports. And we can get into this from a number of different angles. Before we talk about what you'd like to see from governments, how would you characterize what you have seen, let's say most especially from provincial and federal governments over the past year or so? Sure, Ryan. Yeah, actually, since day one, I think we've been we've been in, uh, integrally involved with the federal and provincial governments to get supports out to small businesses. It was critical um, at the time, whether it was um, CERB or the rent relief or any of the other um, programs that were set up by government to help support businesses and individuals during this time. Uh, small Business BC has been playing a role in that. We've been taking literally thousands of calls and emails from businesses around the province to try and help them navigate. That's the biggest challenge that small businesses had is navigating, what do I get? What, where, which way should I go? What do I qualify for? And so we were able to help them through that. And we continue to do so because there are still people experiencing that and, and those programs are still available. Um, but we're also now working with our uh, provincial government on recovery grants. Uh, the applications uh, for those just closed on July 2nd, but the government um, committed to $400 million in non-reimbursable grants to government to help them through the recovery based on their annual income. And we found these to be very critical help supports to get them, get these businesses over the hump um, that might, you know, make them uh, survive through through this recovery process that we're going through now. Nancy, you mentioned that you didn't see the supports in the most recent budget uh, back in April that you would have liked uh, to see. Do, do you see any encouraging signs? Or if not, can you describe for us maybe lobby efforts or, or what you think you'd, you'd like to see in particular? Yeah, so... I mean, there were two things that I think are really concerning. Um, one is, you know, everywhere you look, uh, all all of the signs, all of the reports, all of the data, are, um, re- you know, say that women, uh, including women business owners, were disproportionately impacted by COVID. And based on that, you would expect to see a budget um geared towards providing financial incentives and supports for that population that was hardest hit and um and and yet the money allocated in the budget um to support the the women's entrepreneurship strategy for example was just shockingly low so uh so i mean the Canadian Women's Chamber of Commerce is is in regular discussion with uh, with with that ministry, uh, the you know Mary Ng's ministry that, um, and I said in general. So the, these are things that we discuss with them how how to best use that allocated funds. You know how what the challenges are, how to get that money to um, to the folks that need it the most. Um, the other issue is. The financial supports that the government um, provided at, um, when the pandemic first hit um, in 2020 were um, were fantastic for a lot of businesses, um, and I, you know, congratulate them for for taking that initiative. But a lot of women-owned businesses um, and and uh, businesses owned by um, by marginalized groups were not eligible for them. So they weren't eligible for their SEBA or, or the wage subsidy um, b- just because they're, they're designed very differently and the type of sector they're in, um, they don't necessarily have employees, but they spend a lot on some contractors. I won't get into the details. Um, and I see those same design um, flaws in, in the current um, programs like the the Canadian uh, recovery hiring program has has the same design flaws. So it's it's like we haven't learned anything from from 2020. Adam, would, 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 uh, design flaws. I like the way she puts it. Um, do, do you know the same thing? Yeah, I mean, definitely uh, there were some design flaws early on in the process. The uh, the. the Rent uh, subsidy was was a, a mess the first time round. They improved it on the second time round. 
um, the the large the leaf program, which they call the large employer emergency financing facility, which is meant for the bigger companies. Um, all of them, I, th I think was a, was a, a, a unfortunately very poorly designed program, and really no changes were made. So that led to very few companies actually accessing it. Um, so you know the, the 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 unfortunate part was I think with some of the programs like the bank account, etc., they did a I think an, an admirable job of working with the recipients to try and improve and iterate the, the programs over time. But other ones, they just sort of stuck to their, their guns and didn't really, really change them. Um, and, uh, you know, from a, an ongoing basis, I think that the, the important part will be is when is the right time to dial back some of those supports? Um, you know, there are some businesses that are recovering well and probably don't need them, but there are, I think there's a very keen eye on demand, the return of shoppers, particularly to those uh, consumer facing businesses that were hit hard, uh, tourism, hospitality, et cetera. We can't dial those back such that, you know, after all of this time and investment, the, the, the supports are dialed back too quickly uh, and the businesses fail after, you know, 18 months. I think we have to be very keen, but I do think we have to be very honest in saying which ones don't need support to dial those back at the appropriate times. Um, but the continual thing that I think is really important that as we unfold this, continue to work with constituents, continue to work with the business community to understand how do we best get through this. And I can tell you most of my members uh, are, are feeling largely through that experience and are now looking forward to the investments on the economic growth plan that comes after uh, we sort of feel ourselves through the worst of it. Yeah, I want to ask you to keep going on that because we, we've had several guests on the show that have said the exact same thing, that, it, that at a certain point, uh, governments, and I think in particular they're referring to the federal government, needs to know when to get out of the way. And I think that the uh, I understand that this if I phrase it this way, it might piss a few people off. But but y you need to get to a point where you recognize that we've now hit the the stage where businesses are going to sink or swim based on factors outside a global pandemic. Right. I mean, how do you know when you've got to that point? How do you know? Where if you're prime minister, or if you're minister of labor, or you're you know, in one of these high profile positions, you're going to be able to look millions of Canadians into the eyes through a camera lens and say, we believe that now is the time to start withdrawing or start winding down some of these programs. I, I think the easiest uh, determinant of that, Ryan, is to say, is, is the business customer and consumer facing uh, or is it or is it something that doesn't need to have face to face interaction with a business? So I look at the tourism retail, hospitality, restaurant sector, um, that is still not through the worst of this. We still have a closed border for international travelers to coming to Canada. So our tourism sector is not gonna be through this. Uh, our restaurant sector is probably still not gonna be through this because we have variations in the state of, of reopenings across the country, each province is different. So I think we do need to be very cautious of, are those interactions customer-based? Um, but those that are through it, and I would, Put many of, of our companies in the technology sector, in the oil and gas sector, in the agricultural sector, transportation, logistics are largely feeling through it. And they're now looking to how can we take uh, take the, the, the tailwind that we've got here from uh, resurgence of demand, increased activity from a variety of different things and put that forward. And so the investments there should be looking more about how do we continue to make Canadian companies competitive in, in those sectors uh, that aren't still curtailed by restrictions, uh, limitations, and, uh, and and other sort of public health uh, measures. Tom, we, we, you, you talk about, do you, do you get that same sense? I like this one when Adam says the majority of their members, uh, and Adam, jump in if, if you need to take issue with how I'm characterizing your comment, but, but the majority of members are starting to feel like they can see the light at the end of the tunnel and it's not the lamp of an oncoming train. In other words, there is that optimism. Do you get that same sense when, when, when you take a look at, at the small business landscape in British Columbia? Yeah, I mean, I think from certain sectors, that's probably very true here in British Columbia, too, um, that there are people experiencing the light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, me, for instance, just as an example, I went to a work related event for the first time with real life people in a room uh, like m about 45 to 50 people in a room without masks wow um walking walking into the building without a mask i mean it's you know masks masks are now recommended in many locations including transit i heard when i got on the train to go to that event um so i think 
people, those kinds of things folks are seeing. Um, there are still many businesses though that are negatively, negatively impacted. The, those customers, uh, getting them to come back is a challenge in many ways, um, especially if you have bricks and mortar stores. And then for those businesses too, I will say in a shout out to both governments and their supports for um, helping businesses develop e-commerce platforms and online platforms um, to allow um, consumers to continue to shop at these businesses during the pandemic and, and afterward. I was shocked how many businesses did not even have a website when, when this first began. And then that goes to infrastructure too, which hopefully government is putting more into infrastructure because I know nationally, this is such a huge country and the um, internet access for many folks and especially rural areas here in BC and the North and the interior in particular, it's very challenging. And so those kinds of things that can help businesses and consumers um, really need to be looked at too. But I think there is, to your question, um, there's a sense of optimism now um, we're, we're still not out of the woods, but, um, it's at least the light is at the end of the tunnel. Hmm. We've got lawless as on our live chat saying our family owned small business is actually a really small business. Didn't qualify for anything other than things we could just punt down the road, which would have ultimately made things worse for us. Uh, we're still about 80% down. Let's, let's talk about the flip side. Let's talk about employees. We, we talked about, you know, power ed at Athabasca University. One example or one way that people are, are bettering themselves or adding to their skill sets or, or, you know, a way to make yourself maybe more noticeable or more attractive on a, what could be a competitive job market uh, coming out of these. Tom, we'll start with you. What, what, what would be advice for people right now that are either underemployed or unemployed? Maybe some people that haven't worked in in a year and a half or longer that are that are hearing this talk of optimism. They're eager to get back at it and start contributing what do employees need to bring to the table these days that, that might be a little bit different than it was a couple of years ago? You know, I think that for, you know, we're seeing a lot of employees uh, uh, struggling to come back and um, partially because of the benefits they receive from government are actually better paying than the salaries that mm -hmm. they might get at, at the jobs that they had prior to it. And so, and I don't blame people for now. It's like, well, do I stay at home and collect a check and, and, or do I spend most of my day at an office, you know, making less than what I'm making now? Um, so that's a challenge to bring people back. Um, we are trying to support our businesses here in DC by offering alternative employment solutions, you know, creating, creating opportunities for folks with disabilities, both entrepreneurs and employees with disabilities, for example, um, giving a platform to indigenous women youth, immigrant, and, and people of color led businesses um, here in the province as well, because we need to cast a broader net. Um, for those that are for those that are looking for jobs, I know those jobs are out there. Our, our company itself um, has currently five openings um, and that we'll, we'll be posting for. Um, I think that the pandemic made for another way, like I said, people looking at their lives and looking for changes in their lives. So I think that a lot of companies are experiencing this right now. So those jobs are going to be there, at least at least here from my perspective. Um, I can't speak for the rest of the country, though. Hmm. Emma's watching right now. She says, you know, women's participation in the workforce has reached its lowest level in 30 years. Um, it's so frustrating. Nancy, let me ask, ask you the same question. When it comes to what potential employees uh, need to bring to the table, uh, these days, what's what's catching the attention of employers? What can women do in particular right now or generally speaking, your members uh, when it comes to readying themselves for what could be opportunity? Well, you know, I think that um, I think that it's a tricky question because, you know, you can take all the courses you like. You can um, focus on, you know, this what I call the cult of uh, self-improvement. Mm. Um, you can focus on that all you like at the end of the day. Um, if you are lucky enough for, uh, an algorithm to determine that you are worthy of an interview at, at a company, because, uh, unless you're applying to uh, quite a small company, a lot of times HR is, is determined by algorithms, right? Um, Okay, you, you, you get your face-to-face -face interview. There are, you know, there are a lot of uh, gender norms and um, there's a culture in which we all grow up in um, and have internalized various um, ideas about people, um, including 
um, ideas around gender, uh, race, these unconscious biases, people have them. Um, we can argue about, um, people argue about whether or not this is true. I, it, it is the way it is. It is, uh, you know, there is uncertainty um, when an employer um, sees someone and they think that um, they may or may not um, leave the role because of other responsibilities in their life. Right. Um, and I think that um, it is it is something that really impacts how we view employees, how we view employers, um, as uh, as well as you know the contracts that we enter into. It doesn't make us terrible people. The issue is the system, and and we all internalize these beliefs. So I think that um, to the best of your ability, really, you just have to be as honest as possible with what you're looking for with your employer, and um, and hope for the best. It, it it is a really tricky situation right now. I I would say personally, do not invest your own money or go into debt with this cult of self-improvement, I honestly don't think it's going to get you that much farther than the ne- the person next to you. I, I think there's a lot of free courses out there where you can up your, your tech skills. That's my personal advice. Me, Nancy Wilson. Hang on a second though. You Nancy Wilson, let me ask you something. This cult of self-improvement you're saying, you're essentially saying it's not worth it, but, but the, uh, and I'm not saying I disagree. I just want to pick your brain. I want to dig into it a little bit yeah. more. But but the whole the the, the words are self improvement. So That's I mean, right. w- whether or not that translates into a job or not isn't isn't it worth pursuing to just improve yourself? Yeah. What, what's what's cultish about it? Right. So uh, I'm I'm not saying don't improve yourself. Don't seek out um, ways to um, upskill. What I'm saying is. And um, until you are, um, until you're on a career path, I personally um, would not invest my own money in um, in a specific course because mm-hmm. new technology, new skills uh, are required at such a rapid rate right now. That if I go into a, a year long course to to upskill on on this, by the time I graduate, um, you know that something else may be the new thing, um, and I've gone into potential debt learning that. If I wait until I'm on a specific career path, I'm going to have a much better idea of what type of professional development is actually going to bring me a return on investment. What I will do to upskill is look for um, free or extremely low cost ways to build those skills. And, and they exist um, with, um, you know, these, these large um, online university courses that you can take. Um, LinkedIn has, has a variety of, of free um, skills. There's podcasts. There's all sorts of ways you can upskill yourself without making a significant investment. Obviously, if if you want to completely pivot your career and become a lawyer, that's a separate thing. But building up your soft skills, don't dump 500. Anyways, I, I'm not going to give specific advice, but this this is what I think. Yeah, no, I think it's great. And 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 quite frankly, I, I really enjoy when expert guests go off script. That's kind of the whole point of these longer form conversations, right? Let's get real about this. Um, <laughs> we, 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 we enjoy, I think, in many circumstances, especially ones like this, where we've got three people that have, I mean, a lot of experience, informed perspectives, um, an opportunity for you to, to issue a bit of a call to action or to tie up your argument with a bow to, to give our audience uh, something to think about, something to walk with in the context of the job, the labor market, the the workforce, whatever the case may be. Adam, I'm going to put you on the spot first. What's something you think is worth considering? What should people chew on and digest over the weekend? Um, Recognizing that, you know, there is is immense optimism uh, out there, but we're still not out of the woods yet. And many, many fellow Albertans and Canadians have have suffered a lot. And so it's a time of compassion and understanding. 
um, and trying to think, but thinking about the future. Um, it, I, I think it's, uh, there is positivity, there is momentum here in Alberta, um, but we need to be purposeful about uh, the future directions. And, you know, for those that are, are looking for work, Alberta unfortunately has the highest long-term unemployment in the country. Um, but there are, there are ways uh, to, to position, look at new careers, new pathways, um, new skill development. Uh, and, uh, and I think that given the growth in this, in this economy, uh, there should be opportunities emerging, but it's all about, I think, an eye to the future with, uh, with, with a sense of cautious optimism, but compassion as we go forward. Tom, what would you like us to walk with? Thank you, Ryan. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with what Adam said. And I just, uh, I'll put in a shameless plug for those entrepreneurs, for those with entrepreneurial spirit, and you've been thinking about this during the pandemic or even before it, and you're like, I need to make a life change. Small Business BC is here to help. We have a lot of educational resources, whether it's coming in to get your business named or help you write your business plan, which is critical to a successful business, or you have questions about financing, or you're even a business that's ready to, to sell your business and need some guidance. Um, I recommend you check out our website at smallbusinessbc.com. We have many resources available to you. Um, um, and I would recommend, and I know I have a counterpart in Alberta, uh, Business Link, and in each of the other provinces as well. So check it out, and um, because they're here to help. And 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 I know it sounds like we're the government, we're here to help. But I mean, really, truly, um, we all have teams that are really r professional and willing to help you set up your business. Nancy, last word to you. Um, I would say I would really encourage everybody to be kind to themselves and be kind to uh, their neighbors and their fellow um, Canadians. You know, stop, uh, we ne really need to pull back and, and stop ourselves before judging other people um, and their circumstances and, and their choices. We don't know what they've gone through over the past year and a half or throughout their lives. And everyone, uh, I think, is really just trying to do their best and uh, dur during this tough time. So, you know, enjoy your summer as, as much as you can. This summer's better than it was last year, I think. <laughs> and and next summer's going to be um, even better. So let's just be kind to each other. Yeah, very well said. What a beautiful way to wrap up the conversation. That's Nancy Wilson, Executive Director of the Canadian Women's Chamber of Commerce. Uh, Nancy, where are you in Toronto? Where are you joining us from? Uh, I'm I'm in Toronto. In yeah. Toronto, right. Tom Conway joining us uh, out of BC, of course, the CEO of Small Business BC, and Adam Legg, president of the Alberta Business Council. What a great cross-country checkup. Is that trademarked? That might be trademarked. That might Thanks be. to the yeah. three of you. Have a wonderful weekend. We appreciate it. There you Thanks, go. Uh, and, and I want to thank, uh, I mean, I, I, I dropped in on our live chat. And there's some great comments here. Like, how about this from Lisa, who says, there's definitely things I don't want to return to normal. Right. I never would have thought of working a hybrid day, uh, but I pretty much demanded it. Uh, Lisa goes on to say, by the way, I shop much smarter now and I hope to continue that. See, that's interesting, too, how consumer habits have changed. Right. Like I, I, I've seen some comments here, some really good ones. Penny says, I, I find it interesting that returning to a previous level of consumerism is regarded as returning to normal. Mm. Isn't that a great point? If you like that conversation, we encourage you to smash the like button. Um, I shouldn't say this, but I'm going to say it because some cheeky monkey is going to wreck the streak. But if, have you noticed what's going on right now? Have you noticed we're 90 minutes into a live show? And no down. Nobody's popped in to give us a thumbs down. Mm -hmm. I mean, someone will right now just to be cheeky and silly. Just, uh, and it, it feels kind of... It feels kind of... kind of daring them to do well, it. Well, I don't, I don't know how you guys feel about it, but when you're in a new vehicle... Um, you know, sometimes you got to just get that first ding in the paint or get that first little dent or the first little mm. crack in the windshield because it takes the it takes the stress away. Like it's you like actually pressure cooker. Yeah. You gotta yeah. Get when, when, the... you, when you get that first little scrape, it's actually kind of a relief because, oh. oh, like it's not, you know, you kind of wonder what's going on right now. Like, where's all the haters? Like, are they OK? <laughs> Is everyone OK? Should someone check in on them? Just what Nancy said. Be nice to everybody. So you're worried about the haters. I loved how she rapped with that. Yeah. She wasn't like, you know, dust off your resume and make sure that you put the thing in the... Th no, it was like, be kind to one another. Be understanding. I've seen people talking about tweeting things that are, you know, like, be kind to the 
relatively, you know, and probably in many circumstances, the minimum wage earners that are on the front lines of a lot of these businesses right now having to deal with people that are that are experiencing stress, having to enforce mask protocols or policies. I mean, whatever. There's going to be people um, who I think, I mean, on any given day, you know, deserve respect and deserve the yeah. benefit of the doubt and deserve kindness. But even more so now. I mean, it feels like the stress levels are high. You're hearing of people having conflicts and confrontations and arguments over things like masks now. And I just, I don't know, maybe it's pie in the sky, but but I would hope that we can kind of, you know, come to see everybody is, you know, remember, remember when we all kicked this off back in March of 2020 and started talking about how we're all in this together? Remember that? I do can, remember can we, that. Can we emerge out the same way? Oh, the, the down thumb came in. So. Oh, there we go. Thank you. But we <laughs> added we added several thumbs up, so I'm not too worried about it. You know, uh, Tony, is it Tony maybe, pardon me, says I've been working from home since last March, and, and it did take me a while to get my head around it. But mm. now, get this from Tony, says I'm much more productive. And of course, the commute is great. The commute is great. See, I would have productivity problems where I'm just telling you. Me working from home, I would experience productivity problems. I just, there's, there's, if I see what's going, it's like the dishwasher needs to be unloaded or the lawn needs to be mowed or I can always find something. The bird feeders need to be refilled. I should probably get some water into the hanging baskets. And then I start getting a little more like the tires could be armor all. <laughs> you know, I could organize my nuts and bolts and screws and nails. Uh, I could yeah, I could sweep out the garage. There's always going to be something. Fold laundry. There's always I, something. The dripping faucet. I really enjoyed the working from home. I mean, I I some of my day is still working at home. I'll I'll finish up here and then yeah. I'll go and I'll be able to hang out with uh, with my my family members, my furry family members at home while yeah. I'm I'm finishing up the day. And I actually appreciate when I do take a break, then I can go and do something like mow the lawn or i can go do something like water or or you can go do something like pick up your most recent delivery of grand dog essentials quality raw food and get it into your freezer that's because ranger Mm -hmm. who's sarah hoyle's four-legged family member a beautiful and very good boy 14 out of 10 ranger gets moses and monroe our dogs actually unfortunately for ranger both moses and monroe actually come in at 15 out of 10 i don't mean to turn that yeah they're both you they're both 50 i'm sorry i'm sorry i'm sorry they're they're 15 out of 10 but still 14 out of 10 is pretty good all three of them should we have like we could have like a running race? We could how could we how could we could do like a frisbee catch? Moses oh. would, Moses wouldn't give a shit about that. He would just Ranger would win. Moses would just well, we'll see. Okay, Ranger V Monroe. We'll Let's turn it, it into a we'll turn it into a we'll turn it into a contest at the first ever Real Talk Tailgate party. That's gonna be all part of it. We're gonna be we're gonna have like Bangra dancing. We're gonna have Friesen Brothers there with I think like a well, I don't know what they're going to bring. They've, they've got all kinds of ideas on what they're going to do for this tailgate party. With them, the sky's the limit. But we'll have a dog. We'll have, like, the super dogs as well. Ranger and Monroe going head-to-head. Maybe we can get all the real talkers to bring their pups. Maybe oh we can have, like, a, we can have a real talk off-leash area. Why not? That we, we can invite the team from Grand Dog, yeah. and they can tell you all about how they deliver to your door if you live in Calgary or Edmonton or Central Alberta once a week. And, and they can also talk to you about the benefits of quality raw diets. Or you could right now go to granddog.ca and read all about it for yourself. Just click on the blog link there, how to transition to a raw diet, raw dog food safety. How about this? Feeding raw food to puppies or protecting your dog from ticks. What do you know about DCM and grain? How much raw food do you feed your dog? How do you make bone broth in your crock pot? All of this and more from the team at Grand Dog Essentials Quality Raw Food. If you use the promo code REALTALK, they'll give you 10% off your first time order. Speaking of Friesen Brothers, what are you laughing at? Oh, I just there's shade being thrown at me in the live chat. Was oh, that right? Talking about how um, I, it's hard to get me to mention my dog. Why is that? Is, is, is like so hard to get vegans talking about the fact they're vegans? No, just how do you know it? Do you know how you can tell if someone's oh, a vegan? Yeah, yeah. Don't worry, they'll Don't tell you. They'll tell you. <laughs> um, <laughs> it was in Friesen Brothers. Dang. Friesen Brothers Stony Plain. Literally just yesterday, before they built and opened that South Edmonton location, Friesen Brothers Stony Plain and Friesen Brothers Fort Saskatchewan were the two that we'd visit all the time. So I kind of felt like I was going home again last night and i loved it i'm going to see we're going to see our cousin carson 
Um, our Uncle Clark, Auntie Debbie opened up the pool for us. I mean, we were in the pool till 11 o'clock last night. Why at Rudy? Carrie texts me. She's like, you guys like planning on coming home? And, and like, she's like, Wyatt has bike camp in the morning. I'm like, you think Wyatt's ever going to forget swimming in the pool at 11 o'clock at night? Father of the year. So Carson, my cousin, says, well, I, I said, you open up the pool. We'll bring dinner. And then I realized, oh, gosh, that sounds like a lot of work. So I swung by Friesen Brothers in Stony Plain, picked up a beautiful, fresh-made Italian sandwich, hacked that baby up, some nice, crisp, fresh coleslaw, some beautiful salt and pepper chicken wings, hot and ready out of their butcher's kitchen, beautifully done. And then what do you think we picked up on the fruit side? BC Cherries, obviously. They are featuring BC Cherries right now at all 16 Alberta locations for more than 65 years. Friesen Brothers has been Alberta-grown and Alberta-owned. Wanted to also remind you that when it comes to landscaping, I know a lot of you were looking at what your yard could be. You know, you're flipping through the magazines. Maybe your partner in life is sending you Instagram photos. Why don't we try this? Why don't we try this? And and all your forecasting in advance are the blisters on your hands and the sore back and all that comes with it. Mike and his team at Eden Landscaping would love to take it over for you and make it happen by the end of the summer. It's not too late to bring your outdoor space to life. They've been making dreams come true for more than 20 years. You can find Eden Landscaping online at landscapeedmonton.ca. I was scrolling down to see how, how, how you were getting piled on in the, in the, in the uh, live chat, and that means that I lost my space. I lost my spot. There was a comment I wanted to read, and so I apologize to the listener or the audience member, the viewer that posted it. But, but, but the gist of it was this, is that shopping habits have changed, You know that people have, have developed more of an appreciation for small businesses or for local businesses. I'm curious to know if the two of you, if, if you think that your your consumer habits will change as a result of the pandemic. Have you, have you changed, Sam, who you like to, I mean, essentially, who you're, who you're allocating your, your money to, your hard-earned money? Have you, have, you, have, you, have you changed or adjusted how you spend or how you shop? Yeah, I think that it's, you know, I, I, I don't want to toot my own home, but I was a pretty big support local person before the pandemic sure, to begin yeah. with. So, like... I have a, a laundry list of local businesses where I get stuff. Ordering more things online was very weird for me. Um, and and then, you know, just this realization. What about I, it? Because you felt like you're supporting Amazon or something well, like that? Yes. Yes, it is. Yeah. I hate supporting Amazon. Um, but it's also, you know, a, a big thing that I took away very early in the pandemic is the local businesses have got this. They innovated so quickly and they pivoted so quickly and everybody had curbside literally the next day and they had protocols in place and they had people that just like went the extra mile to make sure they could go. And I mean, part of that is because their livelihood depends on it, that, that everybody just didn't really know where it was. But, you know, the, there's it's kind of that, pr- that, that saying, pressure makes diamonds. Like, we, we got handed this situation, and all of a sudden, we have this beautiful thing that comes out of it, and that we have this robust network of local businesses, and new businesses were forming, and new niches were forming, and people didn't feel like they had to be all things to everybody. I think, you know, a, a big thing that I really took away is that there's there's a lot of businesses that I'll go to for just one specific thing. And sure. I know they do it the best and they're local and I know the owner and I, you know, go it's in and It's the get old that school way of doing it, exactly. right? Exactly. And I mean, that's what I really love about it. Yeah. How about you, Sarah? Have you, would you say, I mean, did you develop more of it? I mean, everyone here, you know, you virtue signalers, you're going to talk about how you've been big supporters, but I know it because I've seen it from both of you and I felt the same way, but, but I feel like maybe that, that sense of loyalty, maybe, has been even is, is more strong, has been reiterated more strong. I love the example. I mean, Nancy talked about it there. Um, a couple of them did about the, you know, the idea of the distillery uh, pivoting to make hand sanitizer. Uh, and there were several that did uh, a good number of them that did. What sort of an impact do you think that'll have on you long term? I don't think I'll ever go back to a grocery shopping to be honest. Except at Friesen Brothers, which Except is the for- spot that I just read, of course. <laughs> oh, shoot. Yeah, smooth move, x Lax. But seriously, no, but I'm just kidding, obviously. But what, But in, in what sense? Like, you, you go a little bit more local, like the butcher, the baker, that kind of idea? No, I order... I order it and then I'll go pick it up curbside and I really hope that Oh, I see what you're saying. You mean I, you don't want to go in the store? Yeah, no. Okay. Cuz I can still I can do all the I mean, that's me being frugal. 
um, because I could just get them to deliver it. Yeah. But um, that's an extra cost. So then I found out that I could order it, do the whole ordering online. Yeah. And then just go do curbside and they bring it out to me. So... Um, that to me has a saved a heck of a lot of time. Yeah, I that's really what the benefit has been. But also, I I boy oh boy, being around a big group of people, I think I might have I think the pandemic might have made me like have some social anxiety. There's no way you're alone on that. Because I went, a friend of mine was playing a show last night out uh, out in out in the open, out in the back alley for a local music festival, yeah. arts festival, and. Um, there was just a huge, not a huge crowd. Everyone was spaced out, but there was just like at least 50 people. And I was like, I don't know if I can do this. So I just kind of stayed around the periphery. So I don't know. It's, I, mm, I, I, there's my two p two pieces, yeah. two cents. <laughs> I'm curious. You're, you're, yeah, your 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 two bits. Um, I'm I'm I'll be curious to see. Like you talk about. I mean, curbside pickup was not is not unique. To, it, it it did not develop as a result of the pandemic, but it most certainly became way bigger of an offering, right? So whether Absolutely. you were you know picking up. Uh, I mean, we've picked up camera gear. Um, we've you know you can do it with groceries, and a lot of people have been doing that with buying bicycles if you can get your hands on them these days. Yeah. I mean, that's so difficult too, but but. I I'm going to be curious to see what businesses or even what industries will continue to offer services or provisions that they did during the pandemic out of necessity and, and how that will now continue. I you know, I can think does. of like, you know, there's a there's a, a beer and wine store, a pretty well known one in our city that, that was offering delivery right to your door at the very beginning of the pandemic. And there was no minimum purchase. I was looking at them going, how on earth are you pulling this off? Well, the, the truth of the matter is just barely in some circumstances got some insight into that. And, and, and so they wound up that home delivery service. It, it ended up, it was, it, was, it was difficult for them. The profit margin was very minimal because people were taking them up on the whole, like we'll deliver a four pack of beer to your house out in the suburbs. And people were taking them up on it because why wouldn't you? They're offering to do it. But when it all came down to it, the profit margin didn't make sense. And so they stopped offering that service. I bet you, though, to stay on the food delivery example, for one, you know, restaurants are now delivering cocktail kits, right? You can, you can order a, a fresh baked pizza or you could order your rack of ribs and then they'd send you a kit on uh, you know, how to make Moscow mules or gin sodas or whatever you like. Uh, maybe vodka slimes. I don't know what the kids are drinking these days. That sort of a thing I can see sticking around for a long time. I mean, why wouldn't you? That seems to me to be a real opportunity there. So I think so. I, it, I mean, you have to look at the 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 pros and cons of it, and yeah. you know, staffing. Like, what does it cost to maintain that? Uh, so yeah, I think it'll be proof is in the pudding. It'll yeah. be <laughs> over the course, like over time, we'll see how things develop. Um, I don't. I just don't want to give that time back. Uh, the time that I've saved going grocery shopping, I don't want to give it back. Fatima says I'm with Sarah. Last time I went into Walmart, I got the "Why are you wearing that on your face?" comment. The time she says the time before the guy in front of me was hacking and sneezing. So she says curbside all the way. How about this from Lisa? Says I definitely have far more social anxiety than I did before, and I was never a crowd person. Um, I, I, you know, Brenda says I go in store, but I get panicky from people not distancing, grabbing items in front of me. Right. Uh, I can see that. I, I've, I don't want to tell the story because what if he hears this? Um, oh, there's just a, just a wonderful guy. The thing is, he's going to know exactly. <laughs> he's going to know I'm talking about it, but I'm going to, here's an example. Love the guy. Bless him. But we're back playing hockey now. Right. We're mm. back. We have, we have this Wednesday ice time. That's been like a lifesaver for me. It's it's just uh, I've, I've missed it so much. Uh, the fellowship with the guys and the I didn't know you tailgating did that. The, oh, yeah. Well, because I haven't right. almost the whole time you've known me. Right. And so we, we we're just able to go back. We're, we're back now for, I think, two weeks. And um, boy, am I just I'm skating like the wind. I'm just taking sharp passes, putting them top shelf. You'd never know that I'd missed a year and a half of hockey. You're a forward. Uh, I am just a. a my buddies say that I am on the ice as I am in real life, which is a left shooting right winger. That's that's the position I play when I when I'm on the ice and when I'm off, I'm a left shooting right winger. But um, no, I, I look absolutely terrible out there. And uh, but it's so good to be back anyway. Not the point. So the guys, you know, some guys are wearing masks in the, the dressing room. Some aren't, uh, which is their prerogative. 
everybody there is double vaxxed. That's a rule. And um, it's been a bit divisive for the group. Some guys aren't happy. Um, the majority doesn't care. Uh, you're either double vaxxed uh, or you're not playing. And so there is that. that, And I know if I use the word sense of if I say sense of security, I know that the Internet's going to explode. But but there is there is a feeling. I'm not saying you can't get COVID. I'm not saying that you're 100 percent out of the woods if you're double vaxxed. I'm not saying that it doesn't make sense to continue taking precautions. I'm not saying that however you feel about it is wrong. Uh, but there is that sense of uh, increased comfort that comes with being double vaccinated. Still, I find myself when I'm sitting on the bench really trying to keep distance, but not be obvious about it and not be weird about it. You know what I mean? Yes. And so there's this one guy. He's just a wonderful guy, but he's a close talker, like big time, oh, no. big time close talker. And I'm so happy to be back with him, and I'm so happy to be talking. But I start, I mean, hockey players will know, you know, the bench works. I start, like, right, I start by, like, running the gate, like, next forward out. And by the end, I'm sitting with the defenseman because I'm just sliding down the bench. Did I just about knock that <laughs> yeah. plant down? I did. I'm sliding down the bench the entire time. Now, did I ever care about his close talking before? Not particularly. I don't actually think two years ago I would have even recognized him as a close talker. Mm. But now... I'm hardwired. Now it's like if somebody's even within, if somebody's like two feet, like when our guest there, when Tom Conway was talking about, he was just at a, he was just at a business meeting with 50 people in a room. Nobody's wearing masks. I mean, num number one to me, that sounds like heaven in the sense that like, <gasps> we're back. We can do it. On the other hand, I sound like I would be so paranoid mm. in a situation like that right now. I can't help it. And I think that that's, I, I don't know. I, I certainly can't speak for the majority, but I bet you, I wouldn't be surprised if the majority of people felt that way. I'm, it's nice to hear it's nice to hear that other people feel that way because I mean just even walking down the street um trying to uh, yeah. navigate and be like I don't want to be weird yeah. I don't want to seem weird or paranoid yeah but can you <laughs> so I'll like do the big woo, like just kind of like arc away from people yeah um trying not to be too obvious about it um but yeah the whole like and then taking a step back if someone's getting a little too close um yeah i feel like my personal bubble has gotten a lot bigger a lot bigger <laughs> kathy says i've spent way too much money on skip the dishes because we couldn't go out to eat and kathy says now i hate leaving my house i don't i mean i that's another thing where i mean you look at how people have invested in things like home theater setups you look at, I mean, even, do, do you think, it would not have been possible. I mean, the timing, let me get a little bit out here for a second. And I'm not trying to make this about me, but just I'm one, everyone's got their own story. My, my story is that getting publicly hanged and fired from a great corporate media job could not have come at a better time in trying to do something like this. Because if we would have tried to launch this three years ago, and we would have said, here's what the model looks like. Okay, we're going to live stream our audio on Mixler. We're going to live stream our show on YouTube. We're going to make it available, download it for podcasts. We can bring in guests from around the world on Zoom setups. The audience can tune in now or later whenever they like. You couldn't have pulled it off. I mean, you'd get the average, you know, you'd get the odd person that would have had a great set up maybe they did skype for business or something like that so they had adequate audio they had a decent web camera they had appropriate headphones that sort of a thing but these days hey sam i mean when we launched this thing november 23rd i mean we did so under the assumption which was quite frankly due to the pandemic that the majority of people most especially people that were doing business from home or that were working from home or, or writing from home or instructing from home in other words our entire roster of guests almost every single person had upgraded their setup their tech setup right yeah and i think that there's um you know there's there's another side to this and 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 i'm seeing this in other media that i watch like even when you watch you know like panel discussions on cbc how everybody's zooming in right you now, watch right? things other than real talk sam i, I sometimes sam? do yeah, so sometimes, some, very, very okay, rare. Okay, 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 okay. Uh, I think something else is, you know, let's, let's, let's do that exact same thought experiment, say that we'd launched this three, three years ago. This probably would have been a much more local show. We would have had yeah. guests in studio as much as possible, the occasional person remoting in. Starting a show like this in this climate means 
we can be national right out of Endless the gate. Endless possibilities. We can be international, international right out of the gate. Right which away. I think is just fantastic. You know, yeah. we don't have a limit on where we can draw guests from. Exactly. So so then this turns, this translates as well into people that are like, well, you can't go to movie theaters, right? You're not going out. You're not going to restaurants. And, you know, so Kathy, who says she spent way too much on Skip, by the way, Kathy, sister, you're not alone. Don't worry. We had to have a family meeting. We had an emergency family meeting because I, 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 I'm, I'm really bad. We, we need to bring like, we need to bring Kelly Keene back or some other financial sort of expert to talk. I'm, I'm the worst. I'm the worst on things like checking credit card statements, making sure things are proper. Like, and one month I made a horrible mistake, which was to total up what we had spent on skip the dishes in that one month. And yeah, I was, hor- I was that. horrified. I mean, it was very important that we did because it kind of, we, we course corrected. Cause when you see the number, you're like, Oh geez. Oh, whoa. Right. But like Kathy said, so let's say you've, you know, instead of going to the movies or instead of going on that family trip to, you know, Panorama or wherever you're going to go, probably Jasper national park, along with tourism, Jasper who present, but so people are going to say, why would I go out? We talked about the price of going to the movies the other day. If I've got this, you know, I've invested in this home theater system. Why wouldn't I order food in, right? Why wouldn't I be drinking wine or whatever you're drinking, um, you know, on, on, on liquor store prices as opposed to restaurant prices, yeah. right? Why wouldn't I? And then you're going to have another group of people who are going to say, I can't wait to get back into restaurants, right? Yeah. Can't wait because to them, that's what they've missed the most. I bet a bunch of people are going to be excited to get back into places like movie theaters, whereas, oh, yeah. you know, I mean, it's been taken away from people for a couple if, years. If I could go to the movie theater and I was the only one in the theater. That's always the best. Uh, I'd be there yesterday. Yeah, that's the best part about working, to, uh, you know, jobs where you kind of have hours where you can pick and choose is, you know, you've always been able to do the like Tuesday 1240 screening. Yeah. You can get there by yourself. And then I've told you that's that's how I was able to eat large bags of popcorn before the previews were done because nobody's watching. So I just do like the big scoop and then, you know, you get up and it's all in your sh- just an absolute disaster. So the grocery store I mentioned yesterday I saw poor Kurt Russell, the star of backdraft as you mentioned the other day and they've got him through a long lens on the beach just brutal just being brutal to the guy but like that would be me i would be the guy they'd get through the long lens on the beach you know here he was three years ago here he is now what happened well he started going to movies by himself, crushing large popcorns before the previews were done. That's exactly how that happens. The team at Westworld Computers, speaking of upgrading, I mean, speaking of investing in tech, uh, it's pretty much exactly what we did. We decided to launch this thing. We went to Daryl and his team. We painted a picture of what the show was going to look like. They determined the horsepower we'd need, and then they got us all set up. That's why we got the iPhones, the MacBooks, the iMacs, the iPads, everything here. Westworld's got us hooked up, and they've been doing the same thing for customers, corporate and personal, the so-called residential setup for more than 40 years. That includes their talented team of service technicians. You can book them online or go shopping right now at westworld.ca. They'll ship across the country. That's Westworld Computers. Also, big shout out to the team at Kubi Energy. Coming up on Monday, you know, positive reflections. We get our week started off on the right foot. We've already got some amazing photos and videos and stories of random acts of kindness that have been sent in to talk at ryanjesperson.com. Here's the thing. This coming Monday, we're also launching a major contest presented by Kubi Energy. You can use your imagination with regards to what one real talker is going to win. Let me just say your utility bills are going to hit the floor. All the details coming up on Monday. That contest presented by the team at Kubi Energy. Also, big shout out to the team at Local Waste. So you can find them online. You either link through the Sponsors tab at ryanjesperson.com or you can find them directly at localwaste.ca. It's where you can find their phone numbers locally in Edmonton and Regina. If you'd like to talk about what they're doing to make business relationships better for their clients, how they're growing their business relationships as their partners' businesses grow, I invite you to give Mikkel, Lauren, or Chris a call. The numbers at Local Waste. .ca. You know, each and every Friday, the team at Local Waste Services also gives us an opportunity to blow off a little steam. Everything you're about to see and hear is a result of submissions from real talkers just like you, who tapped into a little something we like to call Trash Talk! 
All right, we've been waiting to launch this one here for a full week. It comes from the city of Grand Prairie, Alberta. That's where Dylan Bressy is an elected city councillor. He heard an off-the-cuff comment I made the other day about, hey, we're getting back to normal in a way. People can get back to playing Frisbee golf. I'll be honest, Councillor Bressy, the minute it came out of my words, I said that was probably a dumb observation because I bet you that people have been playing Frisbee golf this entire time. Well, you caught it, Councillor. He says, what do you mean by people can get back to playing Frisbee golf? Hearing that makes me disappointed. I missed the trash talk submission for the week. Well, Councillor, we took note and here it is. He says, Ryan, disc golf is a COVID friendly sport. It's also free to play with affordable equipment, just $15 a disc. So it's great with those or for those with uncertain income. He says, we've been playing throughout this pandemic. In fact, our sport has been seeing unprecedented growth this last year. Thousands of new players, sold out events, and many new courses throughout Alberta. Worldwide, manufacturers have drastically increased production of discs and baskets and can't keep up. And more eyeballs than ever are watching the pro side. In fact, says Councillor Bressy, just this past weekend, the greatest shot in the history of our sport happened. James Conrad, a 250-foot throw on the 18th hole of the World Championships. Look at this. Hang on a second. Wait for it. What? He says he tied Paul Macbeth, the greatest of all time player who just inked a $10 million endorsement deal. Councillor Bressy says this year has sucked for so many reasons. I'd love if it had never happened. But in terms of disc golf, it's been a great year. I had to use the trash talk voice because people are going to complain now that that was a little too positive for trash talk. But he specified, so there it is. This one from James. James says, I, was, I wanted to talk to you, Ryan, about something. I've been sorting through something I saw the other day while I was driving around. This image bothered me, and, and I was trying to figure it out. He said there was a, a pickup truck with a couple of big Canadian flags, big tires, just driving around. He says, honestly, there's no way I would have noticed this years ago, but Donald Trump has exposed so much ugliness disguised as nationalism, and these trucks with the over-the-top display of that ugliness with their fuck Trudeau bumper stickers and their ugly overtones of white nationalism, they've hijacked Western democracy. They've taken advantage of our unrestrained freedom of expression. They've turned it into us versus them. I hope people can see this crap for what it is. That's not Canadian. That's not something we should be proud of. And it doesn't demonstrate our values. That is all. Thank God it's over. Carry on. That from James. How about this from Miranda, who says the whole calling people sheep thing has really been pissing me off. She says, I wear two different color socks because I like it. I do what I want and I wear what I want. Back in my bar star days, I wore pajamas to the bar. Nobody said a thing. Miranda says, if somebody's comfortable wearing a mask, let them be. You don't know their story. They might be sick. They might be close to somebody that's sick. Or maybe they just don't want to see you, view to see them, calling them a fucking idiot under the mask. Miranda, all kinds of fired up. And this is the edited version. She says, we wear masks on Halloween. At parties, people have the right to wear what they like. Treat people the way you want to be treated. And then the PS is like, have a great weekend, Real Talkers. You're all the best thing that came out of COVID for me. You make me cry. You make me laugh a lot. You make me think about the other sides of things. You've introduced me to a bunch of new friends I would have never otherwise met in the YouTube chat. Uh, I do have lots more to bitch about, but I'm done for now. And then the winking emoji, then a big heart, that from Miranda. You see what's happening here is we can't actually be angry for long. We can't actually be angry for long. Michael says, here's my rant for today. Now we get into it. Frontline staff in this province are exhausted. We're tired of defending our wages. We're tired of defending our education, our training, our life skills. We're tired of being short-staffed. We're tired of being labeled as special interest groups by Jason Kenney. We're just tired. However, says Mike, we're not tired of doing what's right. Whether it's pandemic nurses, physicians, lab technicians, or teachers, we'll continue to be there for the public. All we ask is to be treated with respect and dignity. We chose to serve. If you know a frontline worker in your life, check in with them. Ask them how they're doing. We need your support. Thanks to the Real Talk team for making every day at work awesome. That from Mike, the frontline defender. Sorry for all the positivity and encouragement here, guys. And this one from Dave, who says something that's been on my mind. This provincial government, United Conservatives, keeps saying our nurses are getting paid way too much compared to the rest of Canada. If they were able to think it through, they'd realize why. 
pushing the extraction of fossil fuels for more than 50 years has increased the cost of living in Alberta. When oil companies throw money around, other companies have to respond. There's a difference between living good and living. He says this government only understands upper class living, how to steal from the poor to give to the rich. Nurses can probably get by, but they shouldn't be punished just because they're competent. They want to cut spending so badly? Look in the mirror, says Dave, channeling former Premier Jim Prentice. May he rest in peace. Dave says one thing they fail to mention, Alberta's politicians are the highest paid in Canada too. They're giving billions away to the fossil fuel industry. They should be helping everyday Albertans. Tax money's not for gambling. Nurses are not responsible for saving the government's bad decisions. You would think that saving four and a half million Albertans would be enough. That from Dave, who speaks truth. Thanks to everybody that submits trash talk for our consideration. Talk at ryanjesperson.com is where you can make it happen. Have an incredible weekend. We'll see you live Monday morning right here on Real Talk.